here you see um, a little uh, illustration we use to talk about where the next new treatments can come from. So uh, we've divided up the, the process to create a new treatment into four stages. On the left, you see scientific discoveries where uh, scientists, usually in uni university labs, are, are doing the fundamental work to understand what is going on in the brains of people with Parkinson's, um, to understand whether it's the cells or the connections that have to be treated. That's the kind of work that led to the discovery of GDNF many years ago. Next circle talks about developing treatments. So that, that, that's taking these insights into what seems to be going wrong in, in Parkinson's and turning that into an actual agent that can be delivered. In this case, it's a GDNF in a, in a bottle. In other cases, it could be a pill. But this is a, the scientific work often done by chemists and biochemists to find the actual agent that could treat the condition. The third step is clinical trials, the actual testing in people to find out what the treatment does on the good side, possibly on the risk side, really understanding how it can be used um, to treat the condition in which patients and, and so on. And then finally, when all that work's been done, um, those treatments have to actually be approved. So there's a very big piece of work that uh, often is, is overlooked and is not very uh, sexy, it's not always talked about. Rooms full of binders, marshalling all that data into a really uh, coherent story that can be brought to the MHRA in the United Kingdom, the FDA in US and other countries um, to get the actual approval to start using this as routine treatment in the clinic. So all these stages have to happen. They all have to work to bring new treatments forward. I mentioned that the first step is usually carried out by universities. The middle two steps are usually carried out by biotech companies and pharma companies. They're the, they're the groups that have the very specialized knowledge, the biochemists, the medicinal chemists, the safety experts, to know how to turn scientific ideas into treatments. There's a bit of a problem that's emerged in the last, uh, I would say, five or 10 years, and I've experienced this myself, where uh, some of the companies that used to invest in this area are now saying, it's a little bit too risky, it's too expensive, we'll step, step back, let someone else do that hard work, let's say. We will wait uh, to see they're successful. Some companies are, are doing less of that early stage work. So there becomes a, what we call a funding gap, or sometimes a valley of death, it's called, where projects go through the first stage, and they have trouble getting funding, trouble getting support for those middle two stages, and then they get picked up towards the end. So we know that people with Parkinson's, they've told us loud and clear, many of you have responded to our surveys and been in our workshops, uh, new treatments, a cure, something to stop the condition is what's really needed, what's really wanted. And if there's a gap there and work is not happening, how can Parkinson's UK take care of that? How can we overcome that gap? We're, we're a charity, we're not the largest organization in the world. We have significant resources, uh, but, but uh, not enough to do everything ourselves. So uh, our solution to this is, uh, what we're calling the uh, Parkinson's UK Virtual Biotech. So this is a new term that we're using. You'll hear about it more and more in our communications that you wait eagerly for every month. Um, and um, the idea is that this virtual biotech, it's represented there as a laptop, will be our, um, our undertaking to turn those ideas that are happening in the universities, often with Parkinson's UK funding. We're continuing to fund that work in universities. But actually, those good ideas could come from anywhere. We'll take the ideas, the best ideas from university research anywhere in the world. If we determine they have the potential to make a new treatment, then the virtual biotech will be our undertaking to make sure the work happens to cross that valley of death, cross the funding gap, to produce the uh, clinically tested molecules that will become uh, the new drugs of the future. How will the virtual biotech work? So uh, it really is our idea to act just like a small lean biotech company. These are, the, these are the companies which are sometimes doing that work today. There aren't enough of them dedicated to Parkinson's. So we will do it on behalf of people with Parkinson's. Um, it'll, be, it'll be like, but not exactly the same as a, as a real uh, private company. A couple of differences. One is that, of course, most biotech companies exist for the, for the purpose of creating positive financial returns for their investors. That's their, their model, to make money out of developing pharmaceuticals uh, for their investors. So this is not the case for Parkinson's UK. In our case, the benefit we're seeking is new treatments for people with Parkinson's. And we will optimize everything, not around making a financial profit, but around getting the maximum number of best drugs through for, for treating Parkinson's. Um, the second way in which it's virtual is there is a new model 
um, in which you don't have to have your own laboratories. You don't have to pay for buildings. You don't have to have, the, have dozens or hundreds of specialized staff. Um, instead, you, you, uh, you operate by having uh, contractual arrangements with specialized companies or UK universities that can do this work for you as a virtual team. You engage with one group to do the biology, one group to do the chemistry, one group to do the safety testing. And one of the reasons we're quite certain this will work is, first of all, there are companies doing it. Secondly, uh, the UK has, uh, has the, uh, the, the benefit, in this case, of having a lot of uh, excellent pharmaceutical industry and biotech industry people who are trained and working in the UK, recognized as some of the best in the world. But over the last five years, a number of large companies have pulled out of the United Kingdom, and those people are still here. And many of them have formed little companies to do this kind of work. They actually do the work for the pharma companies still under contracts, and they will work for us as well. So they have the right expertise, the right uh, standards, um, and they know how to do the job, and they'll do it, if you like, as hired guns. But in this case, we'll get them to work on a Parkinson's project. If you like, uh, GDNF was, was project number zero, perhaps, for our virtual biotech uh, project. It really predated um, are working in this way, but for the first project, we can't tell you the names of the project today. It's still under uh, discussion and the contracts still aren't signed, but it's quite advanced, so I can give you a very good outline of this project. There's a case of a British University investigator, uh, a very young, enthusiastic investigator who actually had worked for a short while in a pharma company earlier in his career, and he understood how you have to work to make treat, uh, new drugs, and, then, and that that's a little bit different from the normal university style. So he had an idea for how to make a new drug to treat neurodegenerative conditions, including Parkinson's. And the idea was uh, a very attractive one. It's that we know there's certain types of damage that are occurring in those cells in the brain that Alan showed us are degenerating. Uh, there's a certain amount of damage that occurs naturally. And our cells have a natural system for defending against that type of damage. And if you can think of those cells when they're undergoing the damage a little bit like perhaps a house that's on fire, um, one approach that's been tried without too much success is to bring in, is to tr treat with, with drugs which try to, if you like, put out the fire from the outside, a little, a little bit like calling the fire department, and they'll spray water on the house from outside. But, as I said, these cells have their own, if you like, fire extinguisher system inside the house already. And, and this new type of drug that we're trying to develop will, will be one that essentially turns on the, the endogenous antioxidant system. It turns on the natural uh, defense system so those cells can protect themselves from the oxidative damage. So that's the, my attempt to explain the scientific concept. But we have good reason to believe that it will be possible to make nice small molecules of the type that won't have to be infused by a pump, but should be possible to, to take by, by, by mouth um, as an oral pill. So they had the idea. They did some preliminary work. Uh, many companies said, rather predictably, interesting, too early for us. Come back to us in a few years when you've done a few more uh, experiments and, and gotten further. So the project was at a standstill. We told them we were interested in the, in the project and we've put together a virtual team. Uh, we have people who are working in some of these uh, small companies in the UK who have done this kind of work before for pharma companies, the investigators, and we've hired in-house people at Parkinson's UK who have experience in the pharmaceutical industry to manage all of this. We've put together this virtual team we plan to invest in this project at the same level and with the same kind of expertise that pharma companies and, and biotech companies do. And if we go through all the stages and we're successful, then we'll come out on the right side here with, with the kind of data, the kind of molecule that a larger company like Pfizer or someone else will take on and, and carry through the later stages of clinical development. So we'll be creating an opportunity for them to step in and do the right thing these big companies can spend their research money on cancer or on uh, multiple sclerosis, and we'll be giving them a great opportunity to invest in a Parkinson's project. So that's how we hope it will work, and we need to do multiple projects. In fact, our plan is to start at least two, possibly up to four projects per year for the foreseeable future. So why do we need so many? And that's because, that's illustrated here, we can't be certain it's going to work. You might have a one in 10 chance of it actually turning into a treatment. Sometimes it's one in three, sometimes it's one in 30. You can't be certain each project will go forward. So if you have a number of good ideas and start a number of projects, still, now watch the animation. Huh? So of those ideas, only a few of them will actually turn into 
to new medications. The others will fade away. We'll find out some reason why actually they're probably not going to work. So if we only started one or two projects, there's a chance we wouldn't have any positive result. The way, the way this business is played in biotech, in pharma, and uh, in, in, for us, is that we have to have multiple projects to be sure we have some that will be successful. We currently have already some supporters who understand this concept, are enthusiastic about it, and have made uh, contributions to support the first project. We're planning to start the next one next year when we raise the funds, um, and as I said, uh, multiple projects the year after that. So there's our virtual biotech there, filling that gap in the middle. Um, and, and producing the products which will ultimately be uh, pick, picked up, carried through clinical trials and with the help actually of the critical path for Parkinson's, we think registered for new treatments for people with Parkinson's everywhere.